You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Sarah McHugh, taproom and events manager for Break Rock Brewing and traveling companion of Coda the Lighthouse Dog. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Jeremy. I'm excited to be back, and I have Coda here with me. He's fast asleep because we did a lot of <laughs> swimming today in the ocean. Oh, um, at a so lighthouse? Like, not at a lighthouse. We are kind of near the Boston Harbor a little bit. Um, so he went out. He loves to fetch the ball and go swimming, but hopefully near a lighthouse soon. Yeah, cool. Well, hi, Coda, and hi, Sarah. Thanks again for joining me today. Today is June 19th, 2022, and this is episode 178 of Lighthearted. In a few minutes, we're going to hear two interviews related to Michigan lighthouses, Old Mackinac Point and Eagle Harbor. How's your 2022 lighthousing season going so far, Sarah? It's going. I'm excited that now it's almost officially the start of summer. I guess two days from now will be the official start of summer. Um, and I can't wait to get out and go to all the lighthouses, especially in New England. But I do want to get back up to Portland, Maine and bring Coda there so we can get some pictures of him by all those lighthouses. Yeah, well, we got a great group of lighthouses there, as, as you I know you well know, because we were just uh, together up there a few weeks ago. We shot some video in the Portland area at the lighthouses around Portland and Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I've been editing the video. It may be posted by the time people hear this. I can't promise that at this point, but if it's not posted by then, it will be soon. And uh, that'll be on the USLHS YouTube channel. We certainly had beautiful weather and I think that was a fun day. Yeah, absolutely. I had so much fun and I saw so many cool things I've never seen before and had new experiences of the Portland area that I'd, I'd never had before just by visiting those lighthouses. So it was awesome. Yeah, it was. And uh, Port, the Portland area is definitely one of the, the meccas of uh, lighthouses for New England. Anybody, any lighthouse buffs coming to New England have to go to that area for sure. Definitely. So before we get into today's interviews, I want to wish everyone a happy Father's Day. Uh, Sarah, uh, we're going to start actually with uh, with you and your dad. We're doing a special Be a Lighthouse segment that just happens to relate to your father, Peter McHugh. Uh, you told me a while back about a company he started, and I thought, well, that's a perfect example of somebody being a lighthouse in the community by helping others. So could you just tell us a little bit of the basics of your father's company? Yeah, so what he does is pretty cool. He has a great team of people. Um, it's called Adaptive Design Hudson Valley. And what they do is they create and build custom, durable, and affordable accessibility devices out of cardboard for members of the local community. So they really have an awesome little business. They employ different groups in the community to go in, learn how to cut and build all the different products, and then they send them out to people in need in the community. That is fantastic. That is just such a, such a great project, such a great company on so many levels. So uh, we're going to go actually to a little interview you did with your dad. Uh, so let's go ahead and listen to that now. For this segment of Be a Lighthouse, I'm lucky enough to be joined by my own dad, Peter McHugh, who is the co-director of Adaptive Design Hudson Valley and being a lighthouse in his own community in the Hudson Valley, New York. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm good. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. So could you just start by giving us a brief overview of what Adaptive Design Hudson Valley does? Yeah, it's a, that's a, you know, it's a challenging question, what Adaptive Design Hudson Valley does. It's very, it's very involved. Uh, it's a concept that was started by Alex Truesdell about 30 years ago in New York City, Adaptive Design to create devices for people with physical limitations, whether it's out of cardboard, PVC, whatever, to engage them in, in their daily lives, to help them do what we take for granted, to get involved, to sit at the table, those types of things that, that are made primarily from cardboard. Uh, this whole circle here starts with the donation of the cardboard itself. We have a very good company that we deal with in the Hudson Valley who donates sheets of cardboard to us that, you know, from there we cut and create the, these devices. Uh, we, we go into the community, we find the need that people have, uh, make a design, especially when we're talking about wheelchair trays, 
go look at the size of the person, the size of the wheelchair, all those dimensions, bring those uh, ideas and designs back. And through Ramapo for Children, which is where our shop is currently, we use their uh, participants there who are varying levels of developmental uh, delays, uh, autism, but we teach them basic skills in measuring, cutting, uh, you know, construction of these, these devices, teamwork. So it's a very good production operation. Those individuals and us together create these devices and then return them back to the community. That's awesome. I think it's really cool how there's a cyclical nature to it and it's both the people helping out and the people uh, that have the need in the community being able to help each other. And also the donation of the cardboard and all that is awesome. Um, So who do you work alongside to make this all happen? Uh, Greg Deddy and Casey Hetty. Greg Deddy was really the catalyst behind creating Adaptive Design Hudson Valley and he he wrote me in. We both got. We both went to a workshop with Alex Truesdell about three or four years ago, and we were just turned on by this concept, realizing that there's so much need out there for simple devices that uh, nobody has and nobody creates for these people. Yeah, I've looked at your Instagram, and there's some pretty incredible designs that you guys have come up with, particularly, I know you said the wheelchair tray, and there's been some people that their favorite activity is doing a puzzle, and you've created something that has magnets on it so they're able to do a puzzle right in front of them when otherwise they'd have a wheelchair and not really be able to get to a table to do those activities. That and um, the stander I thought was really cool for some older people that weren't able to stand freely on their own. And with that stander, that stander they were able to have ergonomically correct positioning and be able to do things like brush their teeth and do the dishes. And like you said, things we often take for granted in our own lives. Um, are there any other products in particular that you all make that that help a need in the community yeah you mentioned that tray that this individual didn't need a tray to uh to eat at to get to the table out he was this avid um, jigsaw puzzle man so what we did was and it's tight in these areas where they live he has a tray that's uh, the top and the bottom of the tray we installed magnets so that he could if he's not done with his puzzle the top just goes on, he can pick that up, or a staff can pick it up and put it against a wall and save it for the next day. When you bring that tray back and pull the top off, the pieces have not moved. Um, some of the other devices making for school systems, particularly for BOCES individuals, uh, you know, you look at a, a, a riser for an individual's feet that's angled. This is a person who cannot keep their feet under the desk and it ruins their posture and everything else. We built this device for their feet to set in at an angle to help that. Also in those school systems, I am 67 years old. I sat on the same chairs that these individuals are sitting in now and they're horrible chairs. If you can all recall those hard plastic chairs in schools, we make seat inserts for those chairs that make it ergonomically correct, that enhance your posture, that makes that chair more comfortable, a device that could be used everywhere, not just for people with physical limitations. And again, these devices are made by a combination of the kids at Ramapo and me and Greg and Casey and Hannah Fisher. That's awesome. I think it's pretty incredible what you do and also how you're creating so much accessibility for for everyone and just the opportunity for people to be able to do things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do and all customized to their specific needs and wants and daily activities. Um, And I think I could probably use a foot riser too because I'm pretty short. Um, So I think that's awesome. What is your biggest takeaway from working with Adaptive Design Hudson Valley? You know, seeing uh, people smile when we deliver these products. I mean, people... I know it sounds really simple, adding a wheelchair tray to someone's wheelchair, but it's like a Christmas for them. They smile. They're very happy, uh, especially the individuals in the school system. It's, it's, a, it's a game changer for them. They're, that, that wheelchair tray can also have an iPod holder that attaches right to the end, and they use those in school, and it's helpful to have that iPod, iPad at the right angle, the right height, um, so it's just, they're painted, they're whatever color these people choose, so they, they love the color, they pick a color, we paint it that color. So it's completely customized for that individual. 
And if you want to see some of those smiles and the end products and anything like that, you can follow Adaptive Design Hudson Valley. I believe it's at Adaptive Design HV on Instagram and just scroll through there. There's some pretty neat photos and videos of, of what they do. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. You're welcome. And I'll end with a special quote that reminds me of my father and lighthouses. So quote, a father is neither an anchor to hold us back nor a sail to take us there but a guiding light whose love shows us the way, unquote. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you to your dad, Peter McHugh, for everything he's done as a lighthouse in the community. And happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, everyone. So, Sarah, please help me tell our listeners about our next guest, Craig Wilson of Old Mackinac Point Light Station in Michigan. Sure, Jeremy. The Straits of Mackinac, which connect Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, were treacherous for mariners. The first lighthouse in the area was established in 1829. Mackinac Point, at the northern tip of Michigan's lower peninsula, was given a fog signal in 1890. Fog is common in the area, and during one two-week stretch, the steam-driven fog signal consumed 52 cords of wood. A 50-foot tall lighthouse was added to the station in 1892, built of cream city brick and attached to the keeper's house. A rotating fourth order Fresnel lens produced a red flash every 10 seconds. It was later changed to a white flash. A principal keeper and an assistant were assigned to the station and a second assistant keeper was added in 1909. In its 67 years of operation, the station had only four principal keepers. The construction of the Mackinac Bridge in 1957 rendered the lighthouse obsolete. The lighthouse property was purchased by the Mackinac Island State Park Commission in 1960, and it was incorporated into a state park. The lighthouse was opened to the public in 1972, but it was closed again in 1990. A major restoration was carried out in the late 1990s into the early 2000s, and the lighthouse was open to the public once again in 2004. The light station is open to the public from late spring to fall with a maritime museum and the keeper's house. Craig Wilson is the chief curator of Mackinac State Historic Parks. I had a chance to sit down with him recently when I visited Old Mackinac Point with my friend Nick Korstad. So let's listen to my conversation with Craig Wilson now. I'm here this afternoon at the Mackinac State Historic Parks offices. With me is Craig Wilson, who's the chief curator for Mackinac State Historic Parks. Thanks so much for being with me today, Craig. Yeah, thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. So first of all, just a little bit about you personally. How did you come to uh, be the chief curator for State Historic Parks here? So I started working for Mackinac State Historic Parks in 2005 as a seasonal interpreter at Fort Mackinac, just on summer break from college, did that for several years, uh, went to grad school, continued doing it, went away, ran another historic site, and then just about 10 years ago, a permanent position opened up here as the museum historian, kind of the staff historian, so I came back, took that job, uh, and my two sites of responsibility at that time were Colonial Michelin Mackinac and the Old Mackinac Point Lighthouse. Okay. Uh, then just continued working here, continued getting more and more responsibilities added to my job, uh, and then I became the chief curator in late 2020. Yeah, well, that'll happen if you're good at your job. They'll keep adding more responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing. So uh, I know uh, your work kind of uh, concerns other properties besides the light station, of course. Can you tell us a little, little bit about that? Yeah, so Mackinac State Historic Parks encompasses three state parks here in the Straits of Mackinac, uh, and spread out amongst those parks are six historic sites, the Lighthouse, Colonial Michelin Mackinac, Historic Mill Creek Discovery Park, those are all here on the mainland, and then over on Mackinac Island, we have Fort Mackinac, our historic downtown, including the Biddle House and Mackinac Native American Museum and the Mackinac Art Museum. So wow. we've got a variety of different things, but all related, all tied together by the history of this place. The fort you mentioned, which we passed just down the road here, say the name of the fort again. So the fort over here is Michelin Mackinac. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, that is a European, both French and British version of an Anishinaabek word, the, the people who lived here and still live here today, mm -hmm. um, that's their name for this whole area. Uh, and when the French got here in the early uh, 18th century, actually in the late 17th century, they heard it and 
started spelling it that way, and the British heard it and spelled it a slightly different way, and that's where we get Mackinac from today. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, the fort is that is some of is there some original stuff there? Is it a recreation or combination? Or? Well, we have two forts. Right. So we've got Michelin Mackinac right here in Mackinac City. That is a reconstruction based on now sixty plus years of archaeology as well as a lot of archival research. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it is a reconstruction because the original fort was moved over to Mackinac Island beginning in seventeen seventy nine, where it was reassembled as part of Fort Mackinac, which is another one of our historic sites, and that is entirely original over there. Mm-hmm. So the oldest building is 1780, the newest building is 1885. Okay. So let's get into the uh, the history of the lighthouse, and first of all, a bit about the, the reason for it in the first place. Could you maybe say a little bit about the importance of the Straits of Mackinac and uh, the reasons why the light was established here? Sure. So the Straits of Mackinac obviously link Lakes Huron and Michigan together. Uh, and by, to some extent, also Lake Superior, if you go just 40 miles or so up to the northeast to the mouth of the St. Mary's River. So it's a huge crossroads, Mm -hmm. and that's why people have always wanted to be here, going way, way back when the Anishinaabek and other indigenous people were right here in this spot. They wanted to be here because from this spot, you can go basically wherever you want in the Great Lakes Basin. You Mm -hmm. can go up to Hudson Bay in the Arctic Circle, you can go west to the Mississippi, down to the Gulf of Mexico, or you can go east out through the St. Lawrence to the Atlantic. And so it's uh, just a nexus of maritime traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the late 19th century, there is such a huge volume of traffic on the Great Lakes, much of it passing right through this little three or four mile wide um, slot right out here. It could also be a pretty dangerous place. Right. Uh, so there was a lighthouse built in the 1860s at Magalpin Point, about two miles to the west of us right now. That was considered adequate at first, but what they realized was that while it's visible from the west, it's not visible from the east coming up the Lake Huron side. Uh, and so there was actually a lot of debate in Congress, you know, whether it would be more cost effective to just build one giant hundred foot plus tower that you could see from all over. Uh, but uh, economy won out, and it was apparently cheaper to just build an entire second lighthouse at Old Mackinac Point. So that funding was authorized in 1889, and construction began the next year. Was there a fog signal here before the lighthouse? So the first thing that goes up in 1890 was the fog signal, Mm -hmm. Um, and then the lighthouse itself came in 1892. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm sure it was a very powerful steam-operated horn originally, Yeah, it's two 10-inch steam whistles, you know, kind of the standard setup, uh, two Mm -hmm. boilers inside. One's always kept on standby. Um, But uh, again, something that you would have found at similar light stations, of course, with a unique signal being sounded, though. Right. So the the lighthouse itself, the lighthouse tower and the keeper's house are very handsome, I think. Mm -hmm. They're built of Cream City brick and Mm -hmm. limestone, right? Uh, you know, the term Cream City Brick is pretty familiar to people around here, but maybe not to a lot of the listeners of this podcast. What is Cream City Brick? So it's a style of brick that is made primarily in the Milwaukee area, right. Milwaukee being the Cream City. Um, usually it does have kind of that light tan-ish color to it. Um, it's used pretty extensively in construction in this area, used extensively in lighthouses mm-hmm. because one of the lighthouse district headquarters was in Milwaukee. Unfortunately, it is also prone to spalling. It's Mm -hmm. very porous. Moisture can get inside. When that freezes and expands, it'll just blow the brick apart. Um, And that's something that they were dealing with historically here at Old Mackinac Point at a lot of other lighthouses. We also deal with it today. We were very fortunate uh, uh, just a couple of years ago to have a pretty major masonry restoration project take place over there to address that. So um, it's more stable now. Okay, well that's that's good to hear. So the architecture is fairly un- unusual, I think. It's been it's been called the Castle of the Straits. What uh, what kind of defines would would you say the architecture of this place? What's special about it? So I I know my my boss is very into architectural history, and he'll say it's a Norman revival. Um, you know, it's got battlements on it, um, and. It's unclear why they put that little bit of extra effort into the design here. Mm -hmm. Um, One possibility is that there was already a park surrounding the lighthouse when the lighthouse was authorized. When Mackinac Mm -hmm. City was platted in the 1850s and then actually started being settled in the early 1880s, that area was set aside as a public park. 
Um, and so it, you know, the lighthouse was not off on its own on an island in some isolated spot. It was in a highly visible area. Right. Uh, and that's the best answer that we can come up with as to why it looks mm -hmm. like that. I mean, it's a very distinctive day mark, if nothing else, easy yeah. to identify. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a, a showpiece mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. So uh, it was, one thing that was interesting to me is I, I was reading there were, in the history of this light station as an active staffed station, uh, 1890 to 1957, there are only four principal keepers during that time, so they mm -hmm. must have liked it here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, first of all, were there, uh, how many keepers were assigned here? Uh, generally just a principal and an assistant, occasionally uh -huh. um, a second assistant. Uh, and then of course, when the Coast Guard takes control in uh, 1939, 1940, there does appear to be a pretty steady stream of um, Coast Guardsmen who were here for a few months at a time, they would rotate through. But yeah, as you say, this is a nice place to be stationed because it was in town. Yeah, uh, There was a school two blocks away, the downtown area with all sorts of stores or three blocks away. There's rail connections here already. So uh, it's a nice place to actually live. Yeah. There's a lot of remote lighthouses in, in Michigan. This, mm -hmm. is, this is, wasn't one of them so much. And uh, I'm wondering if there are any uh, particular keepers, uh, personalities among the, the keepers who are here, or uh, specific incidents about life here that stand out for you? Well, I guess something that's interesting, again, in keeping with that idea that there were only four keepers, um, two of them were father and son. Uh, mm -hmm. The first keeper, George Marshall, uh, came from a very large family. Uh, his father, William Marshall, was assigned to Fort Mackinac on the island. He was the ordnance sergeant there. Uh, he lived into the late 1880s. Mm -hmm. Several of his sons entered the lighthouse service, um, so they were stationed all over the Great Lakes. Uh, so George is the first keeper here in 1890. A little bit later on, uh, his brother Charles came to be the assistant keeper here. He had been assigned out at St. Helena. Um, and right around the turn of the 20th century, there was some sort of accident, some sort of incident, and they realized he couldn't be left alone out there, so he came here to live with his brother. He stayed here for a couple of years, but that incident had some lingering effects, and he ended up spending the rest of his life in a state hospital. Oh. Um, and from that point on, there is a kind of steady stream of martial relatives being taken in, being informally adopted. So for instance, uh, Charles's children ended up being adopted both by George Marshall and his wife Maggie, and another of George's sisters who was living at the station who married the assistant keeper William Barnum. So by the 19 teens, everyone living there is related in some way, but it's a very large family. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when George retired around 1919, another adopted son, James took over. He had also entered the lighthouse service and had served at several other stations, and he stayed here until about 1940. So for the first 50 years of the station's history, it's all in one family uh, mm -hmm. being their responsibility here. Okay. Uh, so this question occurred to me, uh, in, I'm from New England, and I, I know a lot about the history of the New England light stations and the family stations there generally uh, had animals. That was a big part of, part of things was usually at least one cow and chickens and sometimes additional animals. Was that the case here as well? So they didn't have farm animals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not there, just because there wasn't a need. They could go buy whatever they wanted. We know they had dogs. Um, there was uh, one, of, um, one of the kids who was living here, uh, George's nephew, Chester, he left behind a series of oral histories in the 1960s, and he talks about having a series of collies. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually have pictures of some of them uh, donated by Chester's daughter, who uh, lived over in Wisconsin and has, has visited us several times. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, every, every lighthouse needs a dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, jumping ahead to the, the end of the, the active life of this lighthouse, not that it's not, uh, it doesn't have a great life today in uh, other ways, but why was the light discontinued as an aid to navigation? Because the Mackinac Bridge was completed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the lighthouse is just a couple hundred yards away from the bridge. Uh, the white towers out on the bridge are over 500 feet tall versus the 50 or so feet for the lighthouse itself. Yeah. 
Uh, it's covered with navigation lights. It has its own foghorns. And so it made old Mackinac Point obsolete. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the earlier ones to be decommissioned in this area. Uh, you know, when we take people up the tower, we can typically see five other lights on a clear day. We can see six sometimes. Mm. And those are all still either active lights uh, or private aids to navigation. Yeah. Old Mackinac Point's the only one that doesn't have a light in it right now. Right. So it was 1957, right? Mm. It was deactivated. Brings to mind the, the popular children's book, The Little Red Lighthouse and the Great Gray Bridge. I don't know if you know that. It's about a lighthouse in New York City that was mm. discontinued because of the George Washington Bridge. We're almost right over it. Mm -hmm. But then the lighthouse saves the day by blasting its foghorn mm. and saving a ship. So it realizes it still has a purpose. Anyway, that's another <laughs> little tangent there. The uh, I know there was a, a major restoration carried out, uh, I think, in the early 2000s before mm -hmm. the place was open to the public. But have there been restoration projects in recent years as well? Yes, it's ongoing. We're not done mm -hmm. yet. Right. It's um, never done. Yeah. No, no. You know, just with ongoing maintenance, but also our goal to both restore the station to its appearance in the 19 teens, so 1910, 1915, somewhere in there, um, but also to add new exhibits, uh, to take advantage of our collections, to reach people in new ways. So uh, we rebuilt the warehouse to house the Straits of Mackinac Shipwreck Museum. Um, as I mentioned, we have an oil house under construction right now. Mm -hmm. um, we have plans to rebuild one of the privies that was outside, again, just to kind of create or recreate rather what the station would have looked like if you came to visit which people could do uh in the teens people could come visit uh and take a tour yeah what would it have looked like at that time so it's it's as you said it's never done it's always always something new yeah well it's the maintenance of what's there but also recreating the station uh, recreating some of the buildings and so forth which is is great i mean it's a really well interpreted here and the exhibits are, are beautiful the shipwreck building i was really impressed by mm -hmm. beautiful little museum there for uh people who are listening who might consider coming to this area if you're if you know somebody is in particular a lighthouse buff uh of course you've got the two fresnel lenses mm -hmm. in the museum do you want, want to say a little bit about that sure we mm -hmm. have uh the original fresnel lens from old Mackinac point on display that's kind of the centerpiece it's one of the first things that people see when they enter mm -hmm. so they can Take a look at it, see see it in all its glory, get an idea of how those lenses worked. We have another one on display that's part of a display about lighthouse technology, so focusing on the science of how how a lens actually works, what what is light, what is the nature of light, what is the nature of sound, and how those are harnessed to become these beacons um, that help sailors get through the Straits of Mackinac and everywhere else around the world. What else do you think uh, is, there's a lot of interest to, to uh, Lighthouse Buffs, I'd say, to see a, a recreate an interior of a keeper's house as well. You've got some of the rooms set up like they were in what era? Again, uh, early 20th century, so yeah. 1910, somewhere around there. We've got um, some of the public rooms, so the kitchen, parlor, dining room, as they would have appeared when the marshals were there. That's the principal keeper's apartment. So, yeah. you know, we're interpreting George and his wife, Maggie. Uh, and then just more recently, we restored their apartment on the second floor. So the bedrooms, their bedroom, mm -hmm. the bedroom for Chester, um, their nephew who they adopted, the bedroom of another adult Marshall's sister who was living with them. Mm. So we can talk a little bit more about family life there um, because it truly is a light house. You know, it's a light and also it's somebody's yeah. home. People are living there. Definitely. Yeah. So we're talking in late April, and you're getting ready to open for the season fairly soon. When mm -hmm. does the season start? Yeah, we'll open in just about a week and a half here, and the lighthouse remains open until early October. We're open seven days a week, so mm -hmm. people can come and tour the grounds, see the exhibits, uh, tour the tower. One thing I didn't mention is we do have a functional fog whistle that we reinstalled a few years ago, so we sound that multiple times a day. Oh, cool. Um, we're running it on compressed air, so it doesn't sound quite the same, but at least gives you a yeah. sense of what it would have been like. That's great. Do you have, uh, I mean, I'm sure you have some staff, do you have volunteers who work on the site as well? Nope. Uh, we have uh, we have regular staff, uh, mm -hmm. you know, throughout our park system during our operational season, our staff grows to maybe 120, 130 people, and that's everyone from uh, our, our maintenance staff and our operations crew to people working in our museum stores and admissions areas to our interpreters. So there mm -hmm. is always a historic interpreter stationed at the lighthouse. They're the ones doing the 
tours up the tower sounding the fog whistle and they're just there to talk with people answer questions and you know see where the conversation leads them yeah yeah great i have one final question for you for bonus points okay uh, what is your personal favorite thing about your work? Uh, I know uh, we could talk about the wider aspect of your work, but specifically about the uh, the old Mackinac Light Station, what do you like best? The research aspect of it, looking at the logs, um, you know, so much of it is mundane and so much of it by regulation is supposed to be used the minimum of words. You know, that's what the uh, instructions to light keeper said. You get one line to record <laughs> everything that happened today. Right. Uh, but reading through those logs, for the 65 years that the station was in operation, you get to see some really interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, Charles Marshall, for instance, uh, who was here as the assistant keeper, the the entry for his last day, it says the assistant keeper was adjudged insane and taken away to the state hospital uh, in Traverse City, where, again, he spent the rest of his life. Mm. Um, a little bit later on, there appears to have been an ongoing feud between um, George Marshall, and I think it's the second assistant keeper, a man named Chapman. I can't tell if George was just exceptionally hidebound and very much following all the rules, or if Chapman was that much a troublemaker because he he kept showing up to work drunk. Uh, he would just go AWOL. He would go missing for days at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, but he stayed on. Yeah. They, uh, so what was it like at the the light station here with these two people who appear to not really get along professionally. Yeah. Um, But that sort of thing, you know, you can just see so much in these, these few lines in the the wrong between the lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's fun. It's fascinating. And uh, you know, I, I've, done enough research to know that uh, for the most part these light, lighthouse keepers are totally devoted to the job and mostly when there are multiple families usually got along fine but there's a lot of cases where they mm-hmm. <laughs> you know it's kind of sort of luck, luck of the draw and personal chemistry and all that in a way so this is a, a great uh, light station for lighthouse buffs I'd say to come and visit I'm sure you get how many people in a year do you get here? So it, it varies and of course the last two years have kind of mm-hmm. thrown off our trends you know, we'll get maybe 20,000 people mm-hmm. uh, through the lighthouse, uh, which, you know, again, one of our smallest sites only open seasonally. Yeah. Um, we are fortunate because it is centrally located. It's mm-hmm. in the middle of the park. People want to come see the straits. They want to see the bridge and the lighthouse is right there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's really a wonderful place and uh, I'm enjoying my visit. But uh, Craig Wilson, the uh, chief curator for Mackinac State Historic Parks, I want to thank you so much for spending time with me today and for hosting me here as well and for showing me around the light station. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for coming. You can learn more about Old Mackinac Point Lighthouse on the Mackinac State Historic Parks website at MackinawParks.com. That's M-A-C-K-I-N-A-C parks.com. There's sometimes some confusion about the pronunciation, even though the name of Mackinac Point is spelled M-A-C-K-I-N-A-C, it's pronounced Mackinac. Yeah, right. Uh, I I used to be very confused about that. I think I've gotten it straight now because it's it's actually pretty pretty easy. Mackinac City is spelled with a W at the end, but the name of the point and the Straits of Mackinac are spelled with a C at the end, M-A-C-K-N-I-N-A-C. Uh, but either way, it's pronounced Mackinac. And uh, I used to think it was two different pronunciations, but it's not. It's Mackinac, no matter how it's spelled. So, Sarah, let's move on to our second guest. Please help me tell our listeners about Eagle Harbor Lighthouse. Sure, Jeremy. The copper mining industry began on Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula in the 1840s. Eagle Harbor Light is one of several light stations that guide mariners on Lake Superior across the northern edge of the Keweenaw Peninsula. The original lighthouse, built in 1851, was replaced in 1871 by the present red brick structure. Since 1982, the Keweenaw County Historical Society has maintained four museums at the light station. Besides the lighthouse, they include a maritime museum in the old Fog Signal Building, a Keweenaw History Museum located in the old U.S. Coast Guard Station garage, and a commercial fishing museum in one of the assistant keepers' houses. In 1999, Congress transferred ownership of the Eagle Harbor Light Station to the Keweenaw County Historical Society. 
The U.S. Coast Guard continues to operate the light at the top of the tower as an active navigational aid. I visited Eagle Harbor Light Station during my Michigan Lighthouse journey in late April, along with my good friend Nick Korstad, who owns the Big Bay Point Lighthouse B&B. It was cold and windy. It's kind of like a, a blizzard. It was really snowing hard the day we were there at Eagle Harbor Light Station. It was kind of hard to walk around. I didn't get all the photographic angles I wanted to get because I just wanted to get back in the car and get warm. But it was it was really beautiful. And uh, we went inside the uh, the keeper's house. I had a chance to talk with Karen Hintz, who is the vice president of the Keweenaw County Historical Society. Let's listen to my conversation with Karen Hintz now. I'm here at the Eagle Harbor Light Station on the Keweenaw Peninsula in Michigan on Lake Superior, and I'm so uh, happy to be here. This was kind of a bonus lighthouse on my week-long trip here in Michigan, and it's a very beautiful place. I'm here with Karen Hintz, who is the Vice President of the Keweenaw County Historical Society. Thanks so much for being with me. Thanks for hosting uh, us here at the, the lighthouse today, Karen. I appreciate it so much. Well, I'm glad you're here, and as you came through the door, I had to say it's a April, <laughs> winter, spring day, yeah. uh, and you can hear the wind gusting maybe in the background, and then I had to say, and we've torn our kitchen apart because yeah. we're under construction. Yeah. Uh, we have to get busy as soon as we can get over the snow banks because then we open in June. Right, Yeah. You know, in New England, where I'm from, where we, th I used to think we had bad winters until I came here, <laughs> but uh, most, a lot of things, a lot of lighthouses and things like that open for the season around uh, the end of May, Memorial Day weekend. But as you just said, you're opening June 19th. Right. And we don't say it's bad winter. It's never bad weather up here. It's just bad weather clothes. So uh -huh. if you <laughs> embrace yeah. winter, that's why I live here year round, because mm -hmm. I do. Uh, you don't have to worry about not having snow to have fun in because usually we've got plenty of it. Yeah, uh, there's big snow banks as we drove over here, which <laughs> right. is, kind of amazes me. What was it, two days ago we were at 40 Mile Point Lighthouse and it was 75 degrees. Yeah, we were in Mackinac City, it was 37 when we left and it's about a half hour drive to 40 Mile Point and in that drive it got to like 75 degrees uh -huh. and yeah. humid. And that voice, uh, I, I hope people could just hear, is, of course, my friend Nick Korstad, who is my companion on this uh, week-long journey to, uh, uh, I don't know how many lighthouses we visited in the past week. I think it's 30-ish. Uh, I'd say at least 30, and uh, if you include the ones that we saw. That in the distance. You could barely see, and I could barely see, but they were there. You know. Yeah, I took your word for it. I took your word for it. But uh, anyway, so Nick is uh, with us also. So, Karen... Well, why don't we talk about the history of the lighthouse a little bit first. What is the reason for being for this light station, and when was it established? Actually, uh, the first lighthouse that was established here was in 1851, mm -hmm. and this current one was built in 1871 of a more sturdy construction, and it was built um, uh, primarily because the copper mining industry was starting and this was such an isolated area that there really weren't roads built and mm -hmm. developed or communities here yet right. and um, shipping was the major way that um, supplies came in people came in copper went out and so they needed to have a lighthouse to protect um, boats from or ships from hitting the reefs because we have a very rocky shore yeah it's so it's a dangerous place to boat without navigational aids, and the lighthouse was one of the early types of navigational aids the sailors had to rely on. Sure, absolutely. So how many keepers were here? It's a, it's a fairly large house, right? Do you have a, a, did you have a principal keeper and an assistant, uh, one or two assistants? Uh, yes, we had, since the 1851 lighthouse, we have counted about 20, 21 lighthouse keepers, and the mm -hmm. reason I hesitate a bit is because Early on, when this was a real active port, we would have had um, definitely them all living here. And later on, when there, when it was more automated in 1980, um, the lighthouse keeper was more of a caretaker. Mm -hmm. But yes, we have had, um, we think, 21 keepers. We say the Keweenaw County Historical Society is the 22nd right. because we are now the owner of the lighthouse. And those keepers uh, generally had families here because mm -hmm. they were in a community. And when you asked about how many at one time, 
Generally, there was, of course, the head keeper. And when we um, had the foghorn operating, then there would have been one or two assistants. Mm -hmm. And they lived on, as you went came into our site, there is an assistant keeper's uh, building, two-story building that um, was housing for them. And then our brown cottage was the second assistant keeper's cottage, which is now open for renting. So generally, there were three on duty here through much of our history. Yeah, yeah. I saw you have it set up so there's, uh, it looks like mostly exhibits on the first floor and set up to look uh, like it did when the keepers lived here on the second floor, is that right? Right, our goal is to represent the period of significance which we say is from 1871 mm -hmm. when this lighthouse opened to 1939 when officially the U.S. Lighthouse Service became absorbed into the U.S. Coast Guard and so it wasn't um, as uh, much tradition, maybe, as, as before. And uh, so we do try to have our furnishings and our kitchen that we're remodeling reflect more like 1930s, but there's some earlier things here as well. Uh, as far as the history of the, the people here, I'm just wondering, do you have any kind of favorite stories of the people who lived here, uh, personalities or things that happened? Okay. Well, uh, I would say that um, one is Stephen Cocking, and he was, he was um, one that wrote a letter to the U.S. Lighthouse Service begging to get off Gull Rock because wow. he had a wife and children, and that was just like a lighthouse in the middle of the lake mm -hmm. with nothing there. And so I can really feel for the fact that he must have had a lot of pressure <laughs> on terms of can you make can you find a place for us to live with all our children? Yeah. And um, he also had a granddaughter that drowned here. Um, some people ask if there's ghosts. What we can say is we haven't had any lighthouse keeper or family die of anything other than natural causes, but um, there are some stories of paranormal activity here. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, so many lighthouses have those stories, yeah. <laughs> so if these walls could talk, they had a lot of families, and that's yeah. what we're proud of, the fact that they were part of the Eagle Harbor community. Yeah. Uh, Nick and I uh, talk about that kind of thing a lot, that the lighthouses talk to us and have stories to tell mm -hmm. you. Probably, I'm sure you feel the same way. Yeah. yeah. My one friend who's a curator here says that she can sometimes smell that there's pot roast cooking, uh -huh. but I've never, never had that happen to me. Maybe they ate so much pot roast that it's uh, seeped into the walls or something. They had to do a lot to just survive every day. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the lighthouse owned by Keweenaw County? Is that right? Uh, the Keweenaw County Historical, Historical Society. Society. Not, so, so we're a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. We are not funded by tax dollars. And uh, we have a pretty large membership base. Mm -hmm. And the admission from this lighthouse station helps to actually keep us all going. It's not just the light station, but we have um, eight different sites throughout the Keweenaw. Wow, that's, that's so impressive. So in addition to having the lighthouse, we have three other museums on site here mm -hmm. that I can talk about in a little bit. But we also have the school at Gay. We have the Rathbone School in town. We have the life-saving station right across the marina in Eagle Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Central Mine, which is a kind of a ghost town set up for um, looking through older, older um, buildings. Mm -hmm. And we have Phoenix Church, and who am I leaving? Eagle River Museum, and the Baymart Blacksmith Shop. Okay. I think I got them all. And yeah. then here, we have, of course, the lighthouse, but then we have a maritime museum that's located in our Foghorn building, mm -hmm. which I said was operating when we had assistance. We have a commercial fishing museum, which is in the uh, assistant keeper's house, the two-story White House. And in the garage-type um, building is the Keweenaw History Museum. And our claim to fame in that museum is... There is a 1927 Chrysler car that came off the city of Bangor shipwreck. And so we, in addition to copper specimens, we have um, that wow. story to be told there. So a lot of the, the young people like to, to know a story of the cars coming off a shipwreck mm -hmm. and the, on ice in Copper Harbor and being transported. That's incredible. Wow. So, so we have a lot of stories to tell I guess in you each do. museum. 
Yeah, yeah. So anybody, any history buffs, uh, maritime history or any other kind of history, you're going to find a lot to see here in the right. summer. Right, maritime and a lot of copper mining history. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nick and I went to the Sioux Locks yesterday and saw. Okay, yes. Extremely large ship going through there. And yeah, people at our observation deck are out there, like you said, people were braving the wind today. Mm -hmm. um, every, t every day of the year, we basically have people here because we don't close the gates. The buildings aren't open, but we have an observation deck. And when the Sioux Locks open, then we get busy too, and people are watching the freighters go by. Here you can see them go by. Mm -hmm. The person had a short sleeve shirt on that just walked up to the observation deck, and I was like, I stood in the window, so they maybe thought I was a ghost. Oh, okay. There's actually someone there staring at us. I don't know. Modern <laughs> clothes. I don't know if people can hear. See now, and if they're complaining about the weather, yeah. what would Karen say? It's not the weather. It's bad clothing decisions. Yeah, well, I, I can only take so many clothes with me from uh, from my home on my flights. So but. this doesn't have to be in the podcast, but I'm getting close to it. I know this has nothing to do with lighthouses. Have you guys ever seen a Bigfoot here? No. <laughs> Oh, we see so much stuff up here on Bigfoot, and it's just very interesting. No, How we don't do Bigfoot. doesn't mean it all the way up here. Yeah, no. there's a lot of fake Bigfoots all over the place I've seen. <laughs> have you heard stories about people seeing them? Not up here, I have. No? Okay. Right. We have real bears. Uh-huh, yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> have you had bears right around the lighthouse? Probably. Well, I haven't seen any lately. Once no. they close the dump, that apparently kind of, there used to be bear watching when the, the old-fashioned dump was open. Mm -hmm. Now we have a lot more deer. A lot of deer, yeah. 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 How about uh, bald eagles? You have yes, we mm -hmm. do. Yeah. We have bald eagles here, and I always love it when we have a, a tour bus come in, and I can say, well, watch that one craggy-looking tree over there on the rocks, and mm -hmm. that's where that eagle will land. And sometimes I'm lucky, huh. and sometimes it doesn't land. Yeah, well, that's cool. So, uh, again, the, you're going to be opening this season on June 19th, and the, the season goes until when? Sometime in October? Yeah, so? usually early October um, tends to be the second Sunday in October we close. And once we get open, we're open. We're open mm -hmm. every day of the week. Uh, when we open in mid-June, like this year it will be June 19th, yeah. um, and September and early October and all Sundays, we're open from noon to 5. Mm -hmm. But then um, we are open from 10 in the morning till 5 in the evening, Monday through Saturday in July and August. Mm -hmm. So we have um, every day of the week that we're open. It's just that Sundays we open a little later. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm sure that information is available online as well. Right. Yeah. If people Google Eagle Harbor. Eagle Harbor. Lighthouse. The Keweenaw County Historical Society yeah. or Eagle Harbor Lighthouse. Uh-huh. And is, uh, do you have uh, s staff and or volunteers who uh, staff the place? We are run largely on volunteers. Uh, with COVID, we were closed one year, and in that year, we decided to be self-guided right now uh, because before that, we always had volunteer docents, but it was 240 slots that we had to fill with docents, and because they were um, aging, we have gone now to paid kiosk workers that are on duty, and the rest of us, other than the cleaning crew, um, are all volunteers. And that's pretty much how we operate. We're pretty proud of it. Our admission is $8, and children are free. Pretty reasonable. Do you know around how many people you get during the, the active season? Well, thousands. Mm -hmm. um, we guessed last year that we were very close to um, 20,000. At least about 9,000 paid visitors, or mm -hmm. 8,500, I think we said. And then we have the children that don't pay and then we have the people that come on site just to take the pictures and walk around and don't take the time to go inside the buildings mm -hmm. uh, and they often give donations too so about 20,000 I would think we get uh, from being open from our mid-June to mid-October really and um, we really enjoy them and they're from all over the world you have people who are like lighthouse connoisseurs they have to go get their passport stamped. Yep, I was going to ask but you. Yeah. Then they all, we also have like groups of motorcyclists who are just here and are just here to learn and, and find things interesting. Mm -hmm. And then we have people that really want to take pictures. Yeah. We would say we're one of the most photographed um, lighthouses. We just noticed a billboard with us on. We are pretty um, distinct and yeah. um, 
very photographable, I guess. We, we do yeah. have people that come a lot to take the pictures. Sure. Would you say this is one of the icons of uh, Keweenaw Peninsula? Yes. Uh-huh. And we're also pretty proud of the fact that it's the one that's open to the public. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Copper Harbor doesn't have access right now, mm-hmm. and the other lighthouses aren't open. Right. So the Keweenaw County Historical Society does appreciate support because we are the only nonprofit that yeah. keeps one open. Yeah. And that's what's really nice is you'll have people that haven't been to lighthouses too. Mm-hmm. because they're not as easy to get to these days. Right. So uh, Nick and I, a few days ago, were at a lighthouse on McGulpin Point uh, in uh, Mackinac City, and I think they're just about twins. I think so. We, we are a common um, architectural uh, plan, and yeah. I know in Door County, too, there's some that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I get asked about that. You know the problem is when you volunteer at a lighthouse? Mm-hmm. You have a hard time getting away to go see other people's lighthouses. <laughs> but I'm going to have to go check it out. <laughs> yeah. And the the, the, uh, the keeper's house and the tower are uh, mostly red brick, right? But right. But there's a white side to the Yeah, tower? there's a white face to our tower, and that's facing the lake. And we heard that in the early 1900s, sailors were complaining that it was hard to pick out the building because of its dark red brick blended right into our hills. Mm-hmm. So they had us paint it white. And now we're discovering that bricks and moisture and paint are not the greatest combination for preservation. Uh, So we're going to be going through tuck pointing, um, some changes in hoping to make it go another 150 years or more. Because uh, we take the preservation very seriously. Uh, Just the kitchen we're in right now, it used to be a woodshed. We We didn't put wallboard up. We're keeping it the old lath and plaster, you'll see a few cracks, but that's part of what it will be. And we're bringing it back, uh, so if people haven't been here, it will be a kitchen reflecting the 1930s Mm pre-electricity. I mean, we only got internet here last year, so I don't think they were on the forefront here getting electricity either. And our research says that it came in the mid to late 30s when there were work programs during the Depression. Mm -hmm. because it was a hard economic time here to um, during that time. I'm sure, yeah. Uh, You still have an active light. It's still an active aid to navigation. You have a a VRB25, which is a a pretty modern light, but uh, not an LED like a lot of lighthouses have now. And some of the other lighthouses around here have been deactivated, like we just came from Sand Hills and Eagle River. Those are deactivated. Why is this light still working, and uh, do you know why... It still has the optic it has. Well, the U.S. Coast Guard would be your official person to answer that. Mm -hmm. I believe it's still pretty important um, because we have a lot of recreational and boat traffic here, and it is a dangerous harbor. Uh, You do have to be careful, too, when you go into Eagle Harbor to go through the cribs, the two cribs that are at the base. So we have a lot of um, rocky shores. Mm -hmm. So I think they still want to keep it operating. We do know that the freighters have their own navigational aids now um, that go through here as shipping lane, Mm -hmm. but I do think it's important for recreational vehicles as well as commercial fishing and so forth to have it in case their, maybe their other navigational aids fail, it's a backup. Uh, The red and white still is a signature uh, light. Um, Every 10 seconds it's a red flash and then a white flash. Mm And then what I should tell visitors, uh, because we have people who come to lighthouses just to go to the top, Mm -hmm. you can climb almost to the top. Mm -hmm. But because it's an operational light, even though the Historical Society owns the site, we don't have the um, permission to have people go up to the very top. We really promote the fact that we have a Fresnel lens, a fourth-third of Fresnel lens down here on display. We are trying to reflect what it was like to live here as a lighthouse keeper and families. Mm-hmm. Also, we're working on getting a webcam mm-hmm. so oh. up there to try to give the view. Let me ask you, are you, uh, you native to this area? To live? No, mm-hmm. I came here on vacation and my husband went to Michigan Tech mm-hmm. and we just loved Eagle Harbor, the beach. Uh, we were in Door County and I like Door County. Um, but I like the snow here and the quiet as part of the, what attracted me. Mm-hmm. Um, I run into people, they go, well, there's not enough gift shops and whatever and whatever. And I go, well, here 
it's about a lot of the natural beauty, and there's a lot of history here, though. There's a lot here for geology. There's a lot here for um, mining, mm -hmm. and that's very interesting for people to see, too, I think. Yeah, well, I, I understand the attraction of all that. So I have one final question for you. This is for bonus points. Okay. okay. What do you like best about your work with the, uh, the Eagle Harbor Light Station here? I like when I ask local children on a bus trip, have they ever been to the lighthouse? And they say no, and I get to show them the first time. That's great. There and is hopefully they'll bring their family back. But yeah. it, it's very rewarding to me to keep interest going yeah. among young people. Oh, yeah. There's nothing more important. And I've experienced similar things, and I know what you're talking about. It's pretty special. So, Karen Hintz, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, coming out uh, on fairly short notice here and seeing us today, opening the place up and showing us around and for spending some time with me for the podcast. I, I really appreciate it. It's a fun sure. visiting here. And every time you come, you'll have a different view because mm -hmm. the weather's always changing. <laughs> yeah, just wait a minute if you don't like it, right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can learn more about Eagle Harbor Lighthouse on the Keweenaw County Historical Society website at keweenawhistory.org. That's K-E-W-E-E-N-A-W history.org. You can also read about other historic sites managed by the Historical Society, including the Eagle Harbor Life Saving Station. We still have a few more interviews from my trip to Michigan and Minnesota that will be featured on the podcast in the coming weeks. I also just made a trip to upstate New York and recorded a few more interviews. Here's a Father's Day quote. The author Max Lucado once wrote, quote, my father didn't do anything unusual. He only did what dads are supposed to do, be there, unquote. I go along with that. <laughs> Happy Father's <laughs> Day, everyone. And thank you to all the staff, volunteers, and members of the U.S. Lighthouse Society all around the world. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about the tours, preservation grants, and everything else the Society has to offer. And if you listen to this podcast using Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. To all our regular listeners and to all our new ones, thank you so much for listening and keep a good light. I'm a